Hello everyone, my name is Wojciech Waśniewski and you're listening to the Participation Coaching Podcast where I try to explore effective non-performance coaching. So how do we coach beginner, junior and recreational players? Today is a start of a new series of podcasts on junior golf. In this series, I will be interviewing junior golf experts from around the world, trying to understand what makes their programs successful and what are they doing differently to other coaches, as well as how do they grow their programs and ultimately how can we all as coaches recreate their success and hopefully change the tide of plummeting junior participation numbers. My guest for the very first episode of this series is Phil Akers. Phil is a senior PGA coach and the director of junior golf at the Belfry. Before going to the Belfry, he created and developed Fuel Golf, so future elite golf junior program at Alton Hall Golf Academy in the UK, and he grew the program to over 150 juniors. In 2016, he joined the Belfry with a single task of developing and growing their junior offering. In the 18 months that followed, he went from four juniors at the academy to over 80 attending sessions every week which is quite impressive in this conversation we discussed how he did it so how he went from four to 80 including very specific marketing strategies he followed during the first few weeks of launching the program Um, we talk about his um, junior coaching philosophy his person athlete golfer philosophy the structure of his program and progression system and reward system he's using in, in the program how he gets parents involved in their children's golf journeys, what one of his junior sessions looks like, an example session, what it looks like. And we talk about some additional resources he's using on a daily basis, including a parent's handbook and a welcome pack. I really enjoyed speaking to Phil. Hopefully you will learn a lot from this episode and from the rest that we'll follow in in the series. As always, let me know what you thought on Twitter at Wojciech Golf and send me an email at hi at participationcoaching.com. You can also find Phil on Twitter at Phil Acres Golf. And without further ado, let's get into the conversation. So Phil, what's your junior golf story? So you're now based at the Belfry, but that's only recently, isn't it? Yes. Uh, um, so before that, I sort of uh, I had done my AGMS placements at a place over in Ireland called Deer Park, and it had sort of like had this um, amazing summer camp. It's like the largest um, the largest golf facility in Ireland. It's massive. This place, um, and like we had access to this like par three course, and it was just phenomenal. So um, I was under. Uh, a fellow there for the summer and um, anyway we ended up bringing more and more AGMS students with us and it was a fantastic facility just for playing around and learning all about junior coaching really and sort of uh, the more I got into it the more I realized that kids attention spans (laughs) weren't weren't designed just to play golf from what was it eight in the morning till half five in the evening that we had them um so anyway, I started doing more and more studying into that and uh, started to develop quite a good um, junior golf program from there, where uh, eventually sort of like after I'd done my three placements there, they offered me um, a, prov- a, a job over there when I left uni, which uh, we just we started growing really, really fast. We was getting sort of like 30, 40 kids a week on this summer golf program and um, like they absolutely loved it. They couldn't get enough of it. And that was all based around sort of like filling the days with sort of like golf competitions, starting to get them to like children that never played before, starting to get them to learn all about the different fundamentals of the game, but also starting to play golf with like footballs and tennis rackets and all sorts of things like this. And uh, it was just great. And we were so inventive with it. I mean, like we had some really good pros that came out with us, like, uh, Dave Wilson and Dan Beatty who's still out there now. And, um, you know, we sort of, uh, from there, I, I, I decided that my, my main goal within coaching, it was probably this time of year, probably about seven, eight years ago over there. I was like, right, I, I really want to become a tour coach one day. That's, that's sort of like my, my aims and goals. So I contacted, I think it was the top hundred golfers in the world at the time, uh, golf pros in the world at the time, and uh, done a lot of outreach with that, and uh, ended up coming across um, a guy called Mark Pearson, who's a European Tour coach, um, really successful guy, probably one of the cleverest coaches I've uh, ever met, and I had the pleasure of working under. Um, and uh, sort of like, I went to the academy, and I was, I didn't, 
I sort of quickly realized that I didn't really know an awful lot about the game. And if I was going to become a tour coach, um, players walking into the academy with guys sort of like four hour pros there that have been coaching for 25 years and more, they wasn't just going to come to a 19, 20, or what was I, 20, 21 year old at the time that sort of had maybe a year's worth of coaching experience under his belt. So I sort of sat down with Mark and, um, explained what my vision was and uh sort of we was fortunate that we had some other good um tour psychologists there and physiotherapists there um, golf pts and we all put this golf program together called uh, the fuel golf program um or future elite junior golf program um as it's named and uh, it it just went crazy and the fundamentals of it was that we looked to develop the person first the athlete second and the golfer third and um, we sort of scaled it back and um, sort of looked back from what you needed at the top end as a as a tour player all the way back to what we needed from a child, really. And it quickly became apparent that the hard job wasn't sort of uh, sort of like getting kids good at golf. It was keeping them involved in the game for like 20 odd years, which we need them to to get to that standard. So we based our program around that and I done sort of like a lot of research on it and went and done um, sort of like TPI courses and stuff like that, just to get a few ideas about what children like, what they don't like. And, you know, for, um, fortunate, I was sort of like blessed with being able to communicate with kids quite nicely. Like they seem to resonate with me. And I don't think that's the same with all golf coaches. So I think that I was, uh, I was sort of lucky with that. And then as the program started to, grow and develop um we brought some other great golf coaches on board like uh, tom devine who's uh, i know that you studied with on um done your masters with and uh, lee morris Rowe, and the program just kept growing um until we had sort of like about 150 juniors coming in for paid lessons each week then all of them joined as members of alton hall where we was uh, where we was coaching there were sort of like weekly competitions for them and that was um, that was basically my move. That's what happened before I went to the Belfry, and um, pretty much have start has started the same thing. So back in the day, there they had hundreds of juniors coming for each week. But unfortunately, when I came in, junior coaching wasn't part of what the coaches wanted to do there. Um, so there was four junior four juniors coming for golf lessons each week at the Belfry. Um, now we're knocking on 80 each week. Um, and I've just, uh, I've got a new fella called Adam Mason who started, uh, last week with me, who's going to start developing our, got really exciting new, um, schools golf program that's going to be launched, um, over the next couple of weeks. And, uh, he's like, uh, he's the happiest man on happy pills <laughs> uh, uh, like that you'll ever meet. He's just going to be unbelievable with kids. Uh, um, we're going to start to get, a lot more inclusion and it's tricky. I mean, being at a beast like the Belfry, you don't have the same access to golf courses as you want. And as I had at Alton Hall, so that's a tricky part. That's sort of like uh, boundaries that we've got to look to overcome. And, but they've been incredibly supportive so far, but equally I'm not allowed 150 junior members like what I was at, at um, Alton Hall. So they're sort of, uh, it's hard for me to then develop what I want to develop, let's say my European tour players in 20 years. If, you know, like, I don't know what your growing up was like, but I know that mine, like I, I turned professional with six of my buddies because like my dad dropped me off at eight in the morning and picked me up at half eight, nine o'clock at night. Like I didn't have a choice, but to become a good golfer, yeah. it didn't matter what sort of instruction I had. I, I was going to get good at it because I was doing such a vast amount of it. Um, and I feel that if we can develop sort of children with like a growth mindset that they're sort of uh, encouraged to take chances, encouraged to take um, risks and want to push on all the time. Um, and if we can give them a fundamental movement skills to actually go into any sport that they want to. But equally for me to be able to coach them um, with the movements well, you know, let's say with speed, for example, you know, like the guys out on tour, they're swinging it. 113 mile an hour or so so if i've got a kid that's just playing on the ipad all the time it's um 
is not going to develop that athletic ability. So from an early age, I want them playing lots of sports. I want them developing as people, athletes. And, you know, as they get a little bit older, it's a lot easier once they start to understand like adult code, et cetera, um, that they can start to be coached a little bit more um, on the goal side of things. So that's interesting. So you were brought in, um, well, you started working at the Bell Free, when was it? Like two years ago or? A year and a half ago, yeah. And you um, started with four kids. So how did you go about growing it? How did you go from four to, to 80 in, in a year and a half? Uh, so, I mean, what I did when I first came into the Bell Free, I just put on th- uh, three uh, three weeks um, of junior coaching. So I set up my classes that I wanted to have on. Um, and I just rolled them out for free. Just put, like, I went to every single school in the local area, put posters up, gave handouts out, offered free coaching in the schools, and just tried to let, like, hammered our databases, hammered our um, social media sites, sent out emails to everyone that I possibly could to let them know that we've got classes opening up for 6 to 8s, 9 to 12s, 13 to 16 year olds. Um, this is a fantastic new program that we're launching here and um, come on down, come and get yourself a trial for three weeks. And we had a really good uptake on that. Um, so we started with about 30 kids after the first month of doing um, sort of the juniors there, which which was quite a good little uh, starting block. Then from there, um, I, I've been in, personally, I like to go into schools for free and do sort of like a, a day where I cover the whole school with, say, tri golf or um, snag golf or whatever equipment you want to use um, and make them fun, fast, furious sessions where the kids all get um given like a free golf lesson back at the academy or like an open day mm-hmm. then from there we normally sort of get back about about 10 percent of the children that we sort of see that day so you might you might get back sort of 30 children something like that then from there i try and work it on trying to get a 20 percent conversion rate from that session hopefully a little bit higher and slowly but surely it starts to grow but I think the big thing for junior golf programs, um, if you're going to grow them, don't just look for the schools. Look at different areas. Get the guys that are working behind the reception knowing about your program. Get all the mums and dads selling it to their friends. And, you know, before you know it, you've got a lot of a lot of people passing your business. And before you know it, you've got got a fairly big junior golf program. Whereas if you just look at target one area. I think that your your growth rate can be sort of uh, limited. Targeting as, as many channels as, as, as we can, right? Exactly, exactly. Yeah, I mean, like, it's my goal to have it up to 300 juniors after sort of two and a half years. So it's got to keep growing and growing and growing. And hopefully it's just a snowball of it, effect. And that, that's what I found at the previous places that I was at. The better, better your reputation becomes, the more kids you sort of you have coming from different golf clubs more kids you have starting to come from the local beavers and scouts and rugby clubs that you have around you and equally the schools as well and I mean that that's Adam's big job going in there now we're going to start to offer um sort of like paid coaching as well because the kids love it they they love their like before school programs they love um during curriculum times and equally after school programs and then we want them as our feeder schools to start growing a larger pool as I as we can possibly source from, you know, and hopefully in, you know, 15 years, 20 years, we've got a few little budding European tour players in there where I'm standing at the British Open and hopefully steering them in the right direction. That's mm-hmm. that was my goal. Uh, so what's the what's the structure of your program? You mentioned you've got it in three age groups. Yeah, so we've got three chronological age groups, but uh, I like to use the term very, very loosely. We we do a lot. We try and te- uh, treat each child individually. So, I mean, like we start off as a large, like saying, right, we'll bulk you into the six to eight year old group. But you've got a lot of different things that you need to consider with children, be it their biological age, their chronological age, their maturity age. So all of these things need to be taken into consideration, equally their ability as well. So um, I wouldn't say that there's an exact way that I can tell you to bring your juniors through a group. Some people like to do it more on ability. Some people like to do it more on their age. Some people like to do it more on their biological age. 
Um, personally, I like to do it on more biological and maturity ages with it. Um, but there's many cases where children have got friends in their group and they, you know, if, if their social group is a slightly younger age or a slightly older age, I'd rather them stay with children that they like to be with, even if they're not quite at their ability yet. Sure, that makes perfect sense. And how how large are the groups? Uh, well, to one coach, eight children to one coach we have. Um, my bosses would like it to be more so they can make <laughs> more money, but that's, um, I think, for quality of coaching, I think eight children to one coach is enough um personally and then what we're looking to do this year is to start branching out and volunteers are a great thing as well sort of like we we've got a really good support structure that we've got in place now so since i came in i put um a committee of nine junior organizers on board so there's a transfer from these children that are in our weekly lessons into the club and i think a lot of junior golf programs sort of miss the boat with that one a little bit and They sort of like let these kids start to go out to different clubs where really like you've got them there. They're at the they're at your club. You want them as members and you want them playing on your course and using your facilities all the time. And, um, you know, we, we put three, three of the junior members um, on the committee. We put three of the parents on the committee and we've got three people, incl like including myself, um, that work at the Belfry on the committee as well. So we like to have like a big social element to it. So um, I suppose in a couple of weeks time that we've got like our crazy golf competition where all of the juniors and their parents are going to be playing against each other. Then we've got big pizza night after it and stuff. And um, I've gone off on a bit of a tangent there. I've actually <laughs> forgot what the original question was. <laughs> Do excuse me. But um, yeah, sort of our, um, our big, like I suppose that, that core of it is making sure that the children have friendships that, you know, they're, they're not just coming to golf to play golf. They're coming for that social element because it's so much stronger and you never know when children sort of like drop in and out of sports, but they like coming because their friends are there. They like coming because they enjoy it and they're good at it. So it's all got to be relative to them. And if you're putting them in classes that are maybe too hard for them they haven't got friends there and they don't feel very good at it then you know that that's a that's a fast track to them dropping out i suppose mm. yeah so um you mentioned as well at the beginning that the difficult part is is keeping the children in uh what did you find that works best in that regard or have you tried something that didn't work and That's an art art form, I suppose. There's no exact science on it because each of these children are going to mature differently and they've got different, different social experiences and sort of speaking to people like Dr. Martin Toms and starting to understand the sociology side of things, be it like where children live, how much access they've got to the game and so on. is a huge part of it. So all you can do as a golf coach is try and facilitate their enjoyment. And, you know, you, you can lead a horse to water, as it were, but you can't, can't make them drink. You can't make them love the game. But if you try and make the, the games that they're playing fun, if you try and make the facility that they're at child friendly, and I suppose you've got to keep setting them goals that are realistic but achievable with it as well. So I think, you know, if, if you've got a, if you're setting a six-year-old the same goals as what you're setting a 13-year-old, you're probably going to be... Um, your 13 year old is probably going to drop out very quickly because they see it beneath them. And then the six year old might consider them way too hard. So being individual with golfers is, is a nice thing. And it's a sliding scale. So personally, what I've got is like, uh, we try and reward the children. If they, if they show sort of like good, um, personal skills or this growth mindset that we try to base it around, um, they get rewarded in credits. If they if they move up on our uh, physical um, skills, we've got gradings for them with wristbands, different colored ones. And then we've got different golf skills gradings as well. So everyone's got sort of targets and goals that they're looking to achieve. Um, and they know through this grading system whereabouts they are on it, just like karate, I suppose. How did you go about creating this um, this grading system? It, it, for, of, of, all the, of all the materials or...? It was a really, I suppose, Greg Brody <laughs> created it. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, I read his book on European tour or on tour averages and so on and, and tried to work back from there. Um, 
but equally sort of like, I think I was fascinated at first with creating a tour player, Mm -hmm. but the more children you start to get on these programs. And I mean, like I saw a fantastic fact the other day that was posted by a PJ tour that I think it's one in every 326,000 golfers makes it out on tour Mm. to like, you've got to have exit routes for them. You know, like I need a large pool that I can sort of try and draw from, but equally like, I'm a realist. I know that it's going to be a lot of luck involved in this as well, that I've got sort of children that come through that maybe want to, that have the drive, the motivation, the the social um, environment around them, the ability to play and so on, that's going to get them there. So um, I don't think there's any one which way that sort of you can go about it, but I think you've got to treat every child as an individual and just try and set them up for, a love of the game if they love the game they'll do an awful lot of the hard work for you like mm. i've done the hard work for my coach I, I was there 12 hours a day in the summer holiday like if i had just been nudged in the right direction with it who knows where i'd have got to you know but i think there's a real a real um i suppose a real education process that a lot of pros have to go through which gets overlooked at the moment where a lot of pros do coach it old school. They coach children just to hit golf balls on a driving range or just to go out and play a full length golf course. And it's not right. It's probably doing more harm to the children than what it is, um, <laughs> than what it is good, you know? So I'm not saying that I've got it perfect and by no means I have, but that's why I wanted to speak to people like you and the likes of Tom Devine and tour coaches and so on. And then I feel that, you work back from there. So I suppose coming back to your original question, yeah, I sort of looked at the top end, what a European tour player does um, and the the qualities that they have. Not all of them do have the qualities. Not all of them have, say, great movement skills or not all of them have great social skills or technical skills, but somehow they get there. Um, So I suppose my ideal pro that I sort of base this upon is that, that they do have a social a social element to their upbringing where they're a well-rounded human being rather than sort of like getting to that point where maybe they do experience success and they fall off the rails or they they've been they've only specialized and then therefore sort of like their their um their body can't hold up to it anymore or equally through through their psychological side or their technical side something's letting them down so we went on tour averages and our gradings were based around these areas um, to ultimately get there. Um, and I think we probably over it at first. We did base like our top end juniors coming out of this at sort of 18 years old as European tour players being able to achieve European tour averages. But um, we sort of scaled that back in now and reined it in. And uh, we sort of see a bit of an exit route once they do get to around a six handicap or so we try and drive them more towards sort of more individual coaching with this and the group thing starts to become more of a fun outlet for them rather than them taking their real um i suppose information from they use them more as training sessions rather than Mm -hmm. um i I suppose learning sessions Mm -hmm. what would be an example of um uh, of things you do to develop you said you, you try to develop the person first so what's yeah. something that you look at um so like we've got like mentoring schemes where children sort of let's say they've been in the program for a little while and we have a new child that comes in we'll we'll um reward that child if they're if they're showing say good sportsmanship if they're sh- showing them where to stand if they're taking others under their wings then that would be praised, you know, Uh, but we try not to praise them saying like, well done. We try to tell them like that, you know, you've gone above and beyond there and that hard work that you've been showing and sort of like that, your social skills are like unbelievable. Well done. Like with that. And like we reward children that go above and beyond with it. We've like, we've, we've started a scholarship scheme at Belfry for them. Um, So children that do, do show like outstanding sort of like effort be that they I don't know you might have someone that just absolutely loves it or wants to work really hard towards their gradings you know we we see that grit and determination as something that 
we want at the end of the day from our children or if their their coachability that would be a big thing and their attitude towards learning like these are things that are going to see them like stand them in good stead throughout their whole life not just not just golf that might be if they go into say be an accountant or want to be an astronaut or something they're not going to get anywhere without sort of like that grit and determination and good attitude and that and you know we we try to reward that with credit systems so i mean last our last term we had a little girl called emily nuttall um who who won herself a driver we've got little trophies for them and stuff you know if if they're the top of our credit leaderboard at the end of term so it gets really competitive i mean it works nicely for us because we have all of these children like they have to register their credits with us uh, let's say that they practice or they become team captain of their school football team or something like this, or they do something outstanding away from lessons or in lessons. This credit system's a, a big battle for them so that their mum and dad will tweet us, they'll Facebook us, they'll get mm-hmm. emails at three o'clock in the morning saying, look at little Jimmy, he's been practicing or, <laughs> you know, he, he's been awarded sort of like he's heading the nativity play at school and stuff. And we like to recognise that as a person first you know like we like to develop well-rounded human beings not just not just golfers sounds great so what would be um what would one of your sessions look like like an average session let's say (laughs) yeah okay so let's say sort of like we started off um we get all the kids there the biggest thing like when they come in ask children about their day be their mate don't be their coach of it straight off the bat um you know sort of like (laughs) have fun with them play little games like you know, as, as we're walking down to the end of, of the range where we might be doing our session, I'll be chatting about what's been going on in their life that week and actually getting to know them so they don't just think of me as, right, I've got to do what this guy says. From there, we'll look to develop their fundamental movement skills in nice warm-ups, let's say, towards our grading. So at the moment, they're they're learning a little movement called the karaoke, where like they've got to learn how to coordinate their lower body to their upper body and separate. Um, which is important in the swing, but you know, like I can teach five year old this by teaching a little kid how to step one foot in front of the other and then stepping it behind it. And then they start to have to graduate their arms in and then that starts to be able to twist their body and separate the different segments of their body. So we might do that for say 15, 20 minutes. Um, loads of fun games where we'll first work on the quality of movement, then we'll develop it into a game. So, like, I don't know, like we do like this musical chair style warm-up that they'll do where like they'll have to go up and down the range doing this karaoke and then they'll have sort of like different stations be it like a uh, a bunker or a putting green or out of bounds and then as soon as coach shouts out of bounds you know they've got to bomb it to that station and the first one in there they earn themselves a credit let's say mm-hmm. from there we'll have um, different stations and what we'll have we've got themes of information that we like to um, develop with children because you know you look at the top 100 golfers in the world there's 100 different golf swings that I'm not teaching the kid pure technical stuff but what I am trying to develop is their skills towards it so let's say that the skill that day is learning working towards their first iron grading where they've got to be able to hit a, like they score points for hitting a ball over head height with an iron so we, we might teach them about say sort of like do lots of questioning on what uh, what club will go the highest in the bag what would be good for this grading get them all stepping on it's a very visual learning rather than just auditory learning which i find works better with like the younger kids because i don't i don't want to treat them as a young adult they're not they're a child so Mm -hmm. as they develop and they start to understand like let's say adult code a little bit more when you get like your 13 14 year olds that's when you can become a little bit more explicit with them and sort of like almost a little bit more authoritarian but at this younger age lots of questioning let them figure it out themselves and you know that that can take a long time it can take a lot of work and effort not just from the golf coach but from the child and their parents you know as well so um we might have different themes let's say of i don't know getting the club to land on the floor that day to understand that that's how the ball's gonna go up in the air but all of our stations will be based around that landing or that theme of information. And they'll do that for a couple of weeks. Uh, you know, we want them to be able to retain that information. And a six-year-old, if you ask them what they've done at school that day, 
they've forgotten it by 10 minutes later. <laughs> so you need to keep going over these things. So you can't just jump from week to week to a different thing. But children will also get bored if you do the same thing with them each week. So you've got to be creative. So it might be right this week you te- the, you explain it as a club head landing on the ground and you get them all sort of like pretending that they're aeroplanes with it. And then the next week it might be that they've got to sort of like make an explosion of chalk on the floor. The next week might be hitting coach with sand on the floor and stuff like that. And we normally like to have the children sort of like in these um, skill stations for about 20 minutes or so. And it'll be fast and furious. They'll change after every few minutes. And then we'll have competitions with it at the end where sort of like we'll get them working in teams. They'll be working individually. It might be that week that we've got up on the board that there's like a press up challenge where all of the kids, all of the 80 kids coming through that week, you know, sort of like, let's say little Harry Walton's managed to do sort of like 15 press ups that week or whatever in your minute, everyone's going for it, you know, and Hmm. it's fun at the end of it, we'll have a recap and we get kids to come out and explain and we'll do lots of questioning and not one session is the same. It's they're always different. And, I think with junior coaching, you can try and be too, too organized with it a little bit where, you know, kids, kids might just decide that day that that game ain't fun, Phil. So, all right, how could it be more fun? Like, what do you want to do? And like, and still try and get that same piece of information over or that same theme of information over. But you've got to be very dynamic as a junior coach, I feel. And I think it's, it's a little bit different to adult coaching. You can be a little bit more structured with say an adult's development whereas kids you might just find that that day they they've grown a quarter of an inch from last week and their their coordination is all over the show so i don't want to be telling him where where to put his left hand and or left arm at the top of the swing and stuff like that because he hasn't got his coordination that week he's grown he's going through a growth spurt and stuff so you've got to find your way around these things and you've also got to be able to explain it to them that you know what, well, like, I think you're going for a growth spurt at the moment, mate, and have yourself a little, give yourself a little bit of time with this one and make the skills a lot easier. Maybe that's hitting that they're hitting a volleyball that week rather than trying to hit something tiny or you use a bigger club or you use a hockey stick or a tennis racket or something, but you still get your theme of information over and something that they can retain. Mm, that sounds great. So last couple of uh, quick questions. Talking about structure, um, what is uh, what is the the parents' role in your academy now? How do you com- communicate with them? How often? Okay, so with the parents, um, we're currently just finalising our parents' handbook, um, where it's got all information. Let's say about golf clubs, like what they should be doing with their children if they're taking them down the range, why we're coaching them like the ways we are, and. I'll be writing articles every few weeks as well to sort of like send out to parents. There'll be a lot of the the big thing for me, like now that we're starting to get volunteers in as well, um, sort of like doing their Duke of Edinburgh's and stuff like that. It gives me a lot more time to be able to communicate with parents. So I can teach these volunteers how to develop, say, fundamental movement skills and do the warm ups and stuff for the first 15, 20 minutes of session. And that allows me to give time to the parents to explain about sort of like what this what this term's about, what we're looking to develop, how they can help us with it. And my main thing is getting the parents to become their practice buddies, really, rather than their coaches. I think too many parents come in and you'll see it yourself with junior coaching where parents will be, you know, like they're passionate about their kids' development. And unfortunately, they, they've probably been in a generation where it's been very authoritarian, where their parents or their coaches have told them what to do. And I think getting them to understand that actually this is a very sensitive phase for all children growing up. You know, these aren't just young adults. They are children and you've got to treat them as children and children like playing games. They don't like being told what to do. So it might be a slightly longer way round um, to get a child to discover themselves. But if you ask them questions rather than telling them. They re- and they come up with the answer. They retain that information. It's a much more robust way of learning for them. It's actually sort of like getting the parents to actually understand that coaching is changing and sort of some of the science is actually suggesting that, you know what, like these kids should be coming up with the answers rather than you telling them. 
And, you know, if you go down the driving range, if, if you're actually their practice buddy and sort of like exploring their games together and sort of like challenging each other to hit the ball high and middle and low and left and right and stuff like that, and not just giving them the answers of it, their learning is so much better. Their retention of that information is so much better. And ultimately, their, their neural pathways that they start to build, they fire them a lot more a lot more robustly, you know, rather than sort of like being told to do one perfect way and then told to do another way and then told to do another way. And before you know, before they know it, they, they don't really know what movement they're actually trying to make. Whereas, you know, if they've come up with the answer for it, they've got something to commit to there for the rest of their life. Would that all communication be in written form or would you also meet um, like one-on-one or just live meetings with parents? Yeah, sort of like, so what we do, we do, um, So for like new new parents or new juniors to the game, they'll get sent a welcome pack. Sort of like there's a, the brochure of what all of our program is about, sort of like explaining about sort of like person, athlete, golfer, giving good examples of games and stuff that they can help do with it. Um, equally, I'll write articles every couple of weeks, months, and they'll be sent out to the parents like, Let's say the last one was like why it's important to why it's important to foul your child sometimes, and that sort of explains about our grading systems. And you know, like if if the child doesn't say pass a challenge or something like that, like that their failure isn't that they haven't quite passed their challenge yet. It's that if they don't learn from that challenge and show that grit and determination to want to go on and get better at it and th- your role as a parent isn't to say go and coach them then it's to then go and facilitate their practice and help them with it and ask them questions around it because unfortunately I might only see the child for one hour a week whereas the parent sees them at 24-7 you know so they've got a much larger influence to play on that so actually having these little manuals getting them to understand that buying golf clubs three times their size is actually not helpful for them getting them to understand that if the child is forced to practice then the likelihood is is that you're sort of like setting them up to fall out of it or if the if you're looking to unenroll them from football rugby cricket martial arts and stuff actually they'd be better off with like a holistic sporting background rather than early specialization and things like these it's uh There's a lot of information. So that comes in a written form that comes in sort of like speaking to parents that comes through sort of like parents evenings as well. We do lots of um, sort of like meetings with that. And yeah, I think equally sort of like transferring them into the golf environment where the child starts to understand that it's not just on the range, that they've got access to golf courses. And that's what all of this stuff is about. They start to come to me to to learn what to do. They'll say, feel like, you know, I was out on the golf course and everything's going off to the right. Like, what am I doing? And then you explain and, you know, it doesn't take them too long to come up with that their club faces say open and you give them opposite feelings or you get them to suggest little other ways, be it like, I don't know, let's say by te- hitting a tennis forehand, hitting a few of them with a tennis racket. And before you know it, sort of the, the parents start to understand it as well. They They start to understand your slightly different views compared to traditional views of a golf coach and they love it because the kids love it if the kids are nagging them to come back then the parents are happy you know that's that's all they want to mm. see very last question um how has your coaching developed throughout the year so when you first started in ireland what do you think the biggest different difference is then compared to now uh, experience with it i think um sort of i've always had a passion for it i've always been good with children Um, but starting to understand that there's lots of different um, there's lots of different children that you'll be coaching. Some of them will like group environments. Some of them will prefer to be more on an individual basis. Some will be having issues at home. Some will be in growth spurts and so on. And this isn't something that you just know coming out of the PGA or doing a three year course in golf. Like I'm only 10 years into my journey. So I try and speak to as many junior coaches as I can and try and do as much reading on it as I can on the development. But by no means do I have as much knowledge or experience as, you know, guys that have been doing it for 50 years and have actually developed children from their first swing up until sort of like winning their majors and stuff. So 
I've got a lot to learn with these things as well. So I feel that the more people I'm talking to, the more I'm questioned on it and the more I'm challenged with it, the more my program evolves. And I think it's very important that like there are some great resources out there, be it like the Junior Golf Passport and things like this to to help golf coaches to develop junior golf programs. But I think that if your program is fixed and it's not changing, then you're not keeping up with science and you're not keeping up with best practice. And ultimately, I think that you're you're doing a disservice to children. So I would encourage all coaches to be looking into what they're actually doing and reflecting and sort of having people know about their program and to, so they can be questioned on it and actually come up with the answers themselves because it will make them better as coaches. Um, equally, probably the biggest thing that I've learned over the last few years is marketing as well to build a successful um, business side of it. Um, the marketing element of it is a huge thing. So being proactive, letting people know what's going on, being organized ahead of time, like having all of your pricing structures, having all of your classes set up for the year, knowing when your summer terms are and when your holiday camps are, et cetera, and having the right things in place where people can go on and, and book their children in. It's a huge thing as well. I, I think that that organization and time management thing is a big thing that I've learned over the years. And I think um, it was Dennis McDade, who's um, like a king of junior golf with uh, TPI coaching, sort of sent me through sort of his his checklist of what he likes to have at his uh, facility in um, Australia. Like he has all of his coaches just tick off as they go through these things and it might be sort of like letting the parents know when their on course session is letting the parents know when the last hair term is knowing when payments are due etc and um yeah that that was something that i probably went about as a headless chicken as at first mm -hmm. as a junior coach and you know it's sort of like it can be a very uh, parents can be paying quite a lot of money for their for their kid that year like let's say that they're shelling out 500 pounds for the year they they want it to look professional. They want to know that that the coaches that are doing their their sessions are well organised and that it's well marketed and that it's got a good reputation. So shout about your shout about your successes with it and and let people know and let people know best practices and just communicate with them. Really, it's so easy to just get caught up in your own little world of I've got to get this done, that done, that done, that done. And it looks like you actually haven't done anything to grow the program, but actually you're doing a hell of a lot to grow the program. So taking a step back and evaluating that and letting people know about it, I think that's important. That's amazing. Phil, thank you so much for sharing your experiences and, and thoughts. Um, sounds like you're doing a great job over at the Belfry and hopefully you'll reach the, what was it, 250, 350? Uh, next 300 year? odd juniors 300, I'd like 300. to get. Yeah, okay. that's... Uh, that's the start. Yeah, I want to get the management at the Belfry uh, angry with me that they're hitting too many <laughs> golf balls if I can do and uh, create a problem that way. Yeah, the more people that's in it, the better. <laughs> that would be great. Thank you so no much, way, Phil. Great. Thank you very much for your time. This is Wojciech again. Thanks for listening. If you don't want to miss any future episodes in this junior series, subscribe to the podcast. You can find all the links on participation.com slash subscribe. You can also sign up to the mailing list. Thanks for listening again, and I'll hear you next time. Music in this episode came from bensound.com.